Good morning. Welcome to Hitchcock Presbyterian Church this morning. So glad that you're all here to worship with us. I uh, especially want to uh, extend a warm word of welcome to any visitors who are with us this day. Uh, there are welcome cards in the pews. We would love for you to sign those. But we have lots and lots going on in the life of the church. As always, allow me to just take a few minutes to run through some of the things that are coming up this week, uh, announcements that are happening, and then also some pastoral concerns. So the first is that this afternoon is very exciting. We uh, have the honor of hosting uh, our Midnight Run board from New York City for a luncheon here at 1 p.m. Uh, I'm not telling you that because you're all invited to that luncheon, but rather just to tell you that it is an honor to continue our long-standing relationship with Midnight Run, uh, and we are so in privilege to have them in our space for their board meeting this afternoon. And then at 4 p.m., we have our new Choral Society concert for today. It is going to be gorgeous. It is going to be a packed house today, but there are some tickets still available. Just come by at the door, uh, and you are welcome in this space. It is truly going to be a gorgeous concert today at 4 p.m., so I hope that you will come and join us for that. Uh, All Saints names are due. We are just a couple of weeks away from All Saints Sunday, and as we do every year, we will be reading out the names of the saints that you give us. Uh, so the, na- the names of the saints that are important in your life, whether they have ever stepped foot in Hitchcock or not, whether they uh, lived today or yesterday or a hundred years ago, whatever it is, whoever is meaningful to you, we would like to honor them in worship. So please submit those names uh, into the church office, and we will be sure to add them to the list for our All Saints Sunday, which is coming up. Also in November, there is a special event for our youth, especially uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders uh, doing our teen mental health first aid. Uh, as you know, it's, it's not easy to be a 10th, 11th, or 12th grader in this world, and especially these days, there are lots and lots of challenges uh, for mental health. So if you have a teen in your life as a child, grandchild, whoever it may be, that you think would benefit from a training of sorts on mental health uh, type things. Please talk to Catherine. These will be the first three Sunday afternoons in November from 5.30 to 7 o'clock, and we would love to have as many youth as are available to come and be a part of that. Uh, Wednesday evening, speaking of our youth, we're having our annual bowling outing. So middle school and senior high youth will meet over at Scarsdale Golf Club for a night of bowling and fun, so that'll be a great thing. All right, those are our announcements. Uh, Let me move on to pastoral care for just a moment. As always, we continue to keep Rini in our prayers. Rini uh, watches the service each Sunday, so we are glad to say hello to Rini and to remind her that she is in our prayers each and every day. Nancy Hansen as well, who continues to be at the Grove, but is hoping to be released in early November and be able to go home, which means she can come back and be a part of worship with us. So please keep Nancy in your prayers as well. I uh, want to lift up Kyle and Ginny or much uh, who are long time connected to Hitchcock, uh, got married here, baptized their first child here, and now uh, Ginny has had a set of twin girls in the last uh, week and a half, and they are doing wonderfully, uh, but one still in the NICU and all those kinds of things as twins often are, and so we want to keep them in our prayers these days. Uh, We are very blessed to have Reverend Dr. Bill Weisenbach here with us this morning to help him lead in worship and to preach for us this morning. Uh, He was going to preach next Sunday, but we ended up flip-flopping because Bill's going to have knee replacement surgery on Thursday. So we'll keep Bill in our prayers on Thursday as he goes through that fun, fun, fun experience. Very good. All right. Uh, I believe those are all of our announcements for today. Did I miss anything? All right. Very good. Would you please rise and join with Bill in the call to worship? Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. To those those who who keep keep my my Sabbath, Sabbath, who choose the things that that please me and and hold fast my covenant, covenant, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord 
to minister to me, to love the name of the Lord and to be my servants. These, These I, I will bring, bring to my holy mountain, mountain and, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. prayer. For my, my house, house shall, shall be called a house of prayer for, for all, all nations. nations. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Let us now worship the God of all nations, the God of all people. You may be seated. Friends, we know that there is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, a spirit that follows us wherever we go and is always with us. But we know that we do not always follow the call of that spirit to do the work of God in our worlds. So let us confess our sins together, first in unison and then in silence. Eternal God, we come before your throne of grace to confess our sin. We have, we have been, been selfish, selfish instead, instead of generous. generous. We, have we have been proud instead of humble. humble. We have, we have held, held grudges, grudges instead of forgiving. We have proven over and over again that we cannot be good enough on our own. own. We need more of you and less of ourselves. ourselves. Gracious God, we ask for your forgiveness and receive it with joyful hearts. Renew our minds so that we may discern what is good. Fill us with your spirit so that we may be your witnesses in the world. Comfort our hearts that we may know that we have complete redemption by your grace alone. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Hear now, O oh church, who stand in the gap for the world as representatives of God. We have been made clean. As the angel of the Lord touched the unclean lips of Isaiah and made the man whole in word and deed, readying him to do his will, God has done the same for us by the cleansing touch of his son, Jesus Christ. In him, the disparity between our word and deed is made right. In him, our unkindness in action and in word has been forgiven. We are forgiven and free to speak the gospel through actions of justice, mercy, grace, and love. Jesus said to his friends and to his followers, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. So I say to you all now, may the peace of Christ be with you. Please share that peace with one another. Good to see you, Keith. All right, at this time, I'd like to invite our children to come forward for a time. Come on up, guys. Here, let's go up to the steps. Let's go up to the steps. Come on. Come on. Hey, Julia. Let's go up to the steps. Come on. All right, look at all of you. Good job. Look who it is. Come on up, come on up. It is so good to see all of you. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Keep coming, keep coming. Yep. My goodness, look at all of you. This is great. This is great. Can I have a five? Can you give me five? There it is. Have a seat. Good job. Come on up. It is so good to see all of you. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Come on up, hon. Oh, wow. All right. Let's see. We're going to talk about an important one. You can sit there. It's all good. Yeah. We're going to talk about an important word uh, that's a little bit of a challenging word, and I'm going to see if you know what it means. It's the word stewardship. Anybody know what the word stewardship means? That's a hard one. Uh, Let's see. How about the word offering? You know what the word, ah, that's better. Okay, yes. You give something to someone. Yeah, what else? You give a gift to someone. I really like that, yeah. Donating money or toys. That's real good, yes. Tommy. All right, come back, yes. Asking if somebody wants something. Asking if somebody wants something. That is so nice. Yes, it is. All right. There we go. We're doing good this morning. All right, yes. Offering, there are so many ways that we can give of ourselves. And one of the things we're called to do in the church is to give of ourselves to God and to one another. This season in the church is a season known as stewardship season. 
all right? And one of the things that we do, where's Kathleen? Kathleen Dunlop gave a beautiful stewardship moment last week, and who's going to give it this week? Are you giving it this week? All right, she, you, you got to live up to Kathleen. And Chris, you going to come up? All right, very good. We ask people in the church to come up and to share stories of what Hitchcock means to them. Now, stewardship season can be a little bit tricky because there are so many things that the church needs money for. What does the church need money for, do you think? Yes. To have a great church and, yes, that's one of the really important things, to donate to people that are homeless. We do things around here like Midnight Run, and we do all sorts of mission activities where we share with refugees and asylum seekers and people who are in need, people nobody else knows about in the church because we get a lot of calls in the office that remind us that people are in need and we have ways to help them because of everybody else's generosity. It's a really great thing. Here's my question for you. What is it that you can do to give back to the church? Yes. You could give something to someone in need and it can make them really happy. That's a great answer. What else? You could donate toys. Maybe toys you don't play with much anymore. You could donate. What else? Let me ask you, here's one of the most important things, and this is the thing we don't think about all the time when we talk about stewardship, but it's so, so important. You know what the most important thing you can do is? You're doing it right now. You can show up. You can be here. Because it is so important for you to be in this place and to gather together with this family and to pray and to sing and to talk about things that we need to do in the world and to ask really, really hard questions. The most important thing that you can do for this church is to be here. And that doesn't just go for kids. That goes for all of them too that the most important thing that you can do for one another is to show up for each other and to love each other and take care of each other. All right, last word. Go ahead. You can donate toys you don't use anymore. You're the best. All right, let's say a prayer. You guys are so good. You already know all of this. Repeat after me. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for helping us to be generous. Allow us to give of ourselves in ways that please you. Amen. Good job, everybody. Miss Carol's right out there. <laughs> Go right out there. Good job. It's a sign of a really, really good congregation when half of the congregation leaves after the children's <laughs> sermon. It's a wonderful thing. Let us pray together. Calm us now, O Lord, into a quietness that heals and listens. Open wounded hearts to the balm of your word. Speak to us in clear tones so that we may feel our spirits leap for joy and skip with hope as your resurrection witnesses. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm 96, verses 1 through 13. Listen for the word of the Lord. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. 
Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Trender, tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Our second scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperors. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
My heart, as I'm sure most of yours, is deeply troubled these days as we watch and read and listen to the cries of suffering from the thousands of innocents who have been killed, captured, exploited, and dispossessed because of the hate-filled and cowardly terrorist attack on Israel by Hamas. And I mourn the families who have lost loved ones, especially those who have lost children. I know what it is like to lose a child. I do not know what it is like to be a Jew. To know in one's bones that irrespective of the level of religious practice that you would have been condemned to Hitler's ovens as millions were. And even though I love and have visited Israel five times, I do not know what it is like to be so viscerally connected with the place that embodies such a sense of emotional survival and security as so many of my American Jewish friends do with regard to Israel. I do not know what it is like. And I have no answer for Israel as it agonizes over the definition of proportionality in response to Hamas's aggression. I only know that God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jesus and Mohammed and Hitchcock, is a God of love, not hate, of forgiveness, not revenge, of true peace, not temporary truces. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, but only love can do that. Congresswoman Barbara Lee would add, let us not become the evil we deplore. May such wisdom inform all those charged with making the decisions of life and death in these coming weeks. Of course, I'm grateful for the United States for taking such an active role in support of Israel in limiting the scope of the conflict and in working to protect civilians. But I have no great wisdom to share with you this morning on this critical issue. I only have questions that I'm trying to live with. As the psalmist wrote in the first lesson, the Lord is coming, he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with truth. Till then, we must live with the questions for which we have no answers. So in the remaining time, I'd like to do something that's easier for me to talk about. Taxes. <laughs> Matthew's telling of Jesus' encounter with the critics who come to Jesus and say, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Now as then, taxes were not very popular. And now as then, some taxes were more hated than others. For example, the way taxes on clothing are more hated than taxes on tobacco, unless, of course, you're a smoker. The tax that was being talked about in this text is the head tax. It was imposed on every male member of society from adolescence to age 65. From the time you were considered an adult until the time you were considered no longer a threat, you had to pay a head tax to Rome as the token of your submission. As long as you were a potential threat of military age and the possibility of being a fighting man, you had to pay this token of subjection to acknowledge that you were under the heel of Rome. A Jewish man had to pay a Roman official symbolizing that he knew he was his master. There was bitterness in the mouth of every Jewish man after he paid it and every time it was mentioned was like salt in a wound. So the question to Jesus is a trick question, of course. It's an attempt to trip Jesus up in one of the thorniest questions of the day. If he says, no, we're, we're Jews, to pay would be nothing short of collaboration 
with the oppressive Roman regime. If he does that, Jesus is in big trouble for he would reveal himself to be a political revolutionary and Romans would be quick to act. However, if he says, sure, go ahead and pay the tax, he would reveal himself to be a compromised collaborator with the Roman oppressors. It's interesting that this question is not Jesus' question. It is their question. This wasn't what Jesus wanted to talk about that day. It's what his critics wanted to talk about. Jesus asks for a coin. Did you notice his pockets are empty? Whose picture's on, stamped on the coin? Whose image, he asks. The emperor's, they answer. Well, then it's simple. He must own it if his picture's on it. Give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. But you be careful. Don't give to Caesar what is God's. Our text ends there. They leave. But I can imagine the befuddlement continuing. Someone in the group finally says, hey, wait a minute. I don't get it. What's the answer? Should we pay taxes to the emperor or not? Jesus doesn't answer the question, at least not to the listener's satisfaction. Is it possible when it comes to dealings between Jesus' way and the emperor's way, we have no way to know for sure when we have crossed the line? When we are giving to the emperor, that's which we should only give to God. Now, I hate it when there are no easy answers given, when we are left without clear guidelines to follow in our dealings with the state, with governments, with surrounding economic and political order, when we are left with more questions than answers. In his response, Jesus does not solve the problem of our relationship with the surrounding political order but he does define the nature of the struggle. If we're able, based on this scripture, to divide our lives into categorize all the forces that press upon us, to know what is of Caesar and what is of God, we wouldn't have a problem. There would be no risk, no tension, no difficulty taking a position on the major issues today. We could relax and settle down with our arrangements for many, that would mean that over here we have the realm of Jesus, which is personal and private and spiritual and religious, and over there we have what belongs to the empire. Money, politics, power, work, protection, justice, security. In short, everything that most of us think is important in life seems to be in the realm of Caesar. But I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind. North American Christians have been conditioned to believe that because we're fortunate enough to live in a democracy, we don't have many of the problems that plague other nations. But it's not true. We are just as much the victim of the surrounding order as those Jews were who were who persecuted and oppressed by Caesar. A free market economy has many ways of enslaving, all of them in the name of freedom. In a democracy, there's no Caesar, no emperor, which means that here we, the people, get to be our own tyrants. Christian ethicist Stanley Auerwas, who just turned 93, 83, pardon me, was asked if he thought Christians could be involved in government or should they have nothing to do with the state. Our was, who is noted for his antagonism toward the state and his earthly metaphors, responded, no, I think it's possible for Christians to serve the government, to run for elected office. I just think that Christians ought to relate to the government in the same way that porcupines reproduce very carefully. <laughs> Matthew says at the end of this tense interchange that Jesus' critics were amazed and they left him and went away. I hope they left uneasy. 
Just where are the lines between faithfulness to God and idolatry to the empire? When are we offering up to the state that which should only belong to God? How have I entrusted the government or the economy that with which I should only entrust to God? Where is the line? I don't know. I've tried to make the point that there are no easy answers to most of life's questions. But to be responsible Christians, we must learn to live with the questions, not to ignore them. That's one of the reasons we need the church, as Pete said to the kids this morning, to disturb us, to keep us thinking. As Presbyterians, I can guarantee we will never completely agree about anything. That's okay. But we need one another to keep the conversation going, to keep the questions alive. I don't know if any of us will leave church today amazed, but if we at least leave a little bit unsettled, less self-certain of our opinions and arrangements, I think Jesus would be pleased. Amen. Friends, let us now affirm our faith in God together using these words printed in your bulletin. When nation rises against nation and kingdom against kingdom, the end is not violence, for there is a God of resilient, redeeming love, and the brighter purpose as at work in the shadows, and the darkness cannot smother it. When there are earthquakes, famines, and pestilences, and collisions among the stars, the end is not chaos. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has not forsaken us, and the harmony will again break out and gather to hasten towards, con towards consummation. Lord. When believers are arrested and abused, dragged before kings and governors, the end is not injustice. The Holy Spirit is always with you in all your trials and travail, and words will be given to confound your adversaries and shake the gates of hell.
when parents, brothers, sisters, relatives, or friends betray you even unto death, the end is not alienation. The crucified Christ will reconcile all things seen and unseen. And the glorious finale is much nearer than when you first believed. You may be seated. You may be seated. I would now like to invite Chris and Jeannie to come forward for our moment of stewardship today. Good morning. For those of you who might not know us yet, I'm Jeannie, and this is Chris. Our family is among some of the newer members of Hitchcock. When Kathleen Dunlop invited us to speak about why we give, I thought there must be a mistake. <laughs> Surely she wanted someone with deeper pockets <laughs> to speak inspirationally to all of you today. I cited modest contribution as a reason for feeling sheepish, but was only met with kind and supportive words of every bit helps, everyone gives what they can, and was told to remember that speaking in front of you all today is also a way of giving back. So, here we are. We wanted to share what brought us to you and why we love Hitchcock so much. Chris and I grew up in the Bronx and Brooklyn, respectively. We both attended Catholic grammar school and received all of our sacraments and attended Catholic mass every Sunday, almost. <laughs> but when the global pandemic gave us all more than just a moment of pause, we stopped to ask ourselves what we had been doing by rote. We knew what we loved about being Christians, but we also knew what we did not love about a variety of beliefs and serious issues within our church. We were not aligned. We had been putting one foot in front of the other for well over 40 years, but it was time for us to stop and rethink our path, not only for ourselves, but for our children. Our daughter, Grace, told us that her friend, Stella Bauer, loved her church. <laughs> loved? Are you sure? We needed to see this place for ourselves. So we visited Hitchcock one Sunday and were welcomed into the loving embrace that you all know so well. By the end of coffee hour, our children were running and tumbling on the playground. They almost said playground. <laughs> um, playground with old friends and new. And we were deep in conversation with a queer female clergy person, a married pastor with four children. In what bizarro world had we landed, and may we please, please stay. I remember meeting with Catherine about new membership shortly after that. After a meaningful and informative conversation, she gave a tour of the church, complete with our casually standing on the altar, visiting staff offices, the child care room, Kitchens, upper children's, lower children's, and the choir room. In our old church, I don't think I even knew where the restroom was. But on that day with Catherine, I remember wondering if it was okay, and even why we were visiting all of these behind the scenes places, not realizing that they would soon be the actual stage upon where our family would fall in love with church. From Sunday worship to Wednesdays at Hitchcock, the Christmas Eve pageant to the Father's Day chorus, child care to youth forum, there is a place for each of us. At Hitchcock, there is no behind the scenes. We are all players here, friends, right? There is nothing shrouded in mystery or off limits. Our children know every nook and cranny, 
and restroom of this place. They see role models of every kind and know that we are all loved and celebrated for who we are and who we will grow to be. This is the magic of Hitchcock. This is why we give. As for the doldrums of daily life, obstacles still occur. Daycare costs more per year than a small liberal arts college. Ridiculous mishaps occur, such as burst pipes and flooded basements. Throw in a few health issues, none without taking their toll. All of this adds up to say that we wish we were able to give more. Through it all, we still give, regardless of how little or how much. It is the continuous act of giving in which we believe. And we're grateful because here we are aligned and because here we love church. Middle schoolers get a bad rap, but sometimes they make the best evangelists. <laughs> Friends, we have been given much by God and the world around us, so let us take this time to think about the ways in which we may give back to this church and the work of the kingdom of God. We continue our worship now with the receiving of gifts.
friends, please join me in this response of prayer as we dedicate our tithes and our offerings. God, we give these gifts in gratitude for your blessing. We give these gifts with hope as we hunger and thirst for righteousness. May our offerings of money, time, and talent be used to comfort those who mourn, to extend mercy, to make peace, to help all see and live in your presence in our world. Amen. Come and fill our hearts, O God, for you indeed alone are holy. We come this day to worship with a mixture of emotions. As always, we come to celebrate your name, to lift up our voices in praise and in worship. We know that we are a people blessed in so many ways, given far beyond that which we deserve and called to give back. We are a people who are overwhelmed, O oh God, with gratitude most of all for family and friends and community and people of faith who gather together and celebrate the journeys of this life. Some of those journeys are good and some are so very difficult, but we are heartened by the fact that you gather folks around to walk with us. Lift up our eyes, O oh God, that we might truly see your presence open our spirits, that we might feel you and receive you. Open our hearts, O oh God, that we might live with compassion for all those in need. O oh God, in the midst of our gratitude, we are aware that there are so many in need in this world that there are those who are hungry and thirsty, those without shelter over their heads, those without the knowledge of love in their hearts. We know, especially in these days, O oh God, that there are those who are suffering in the midst of war, those for whom violence is steady, those for whom the sounds of war are all around. We think especially this day of children who are frightened, O oh God, of parents who are overwhelmed with a sense of helplessness of the elderly who are unable to care for themselves, O oh God. We think of those in Israel who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We think of those in Palestine who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We ask that your grace and mercy would fill those spaces at this time, O oh Lord, that your mercy might fill up the hearts of all who are caught in the midst of generation after generation of violence. O oh Lord, might your light of peace shine. 
God of grace and God of glory, we think about those in other places of the world as well, especially we lift up Ukraine in these days. Ask for your blessing upon those who are now in second and heading into third years and war and war and violence and violence. Oh God, this is not who you created us to be. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. O oh Lord, for those who are on our prayer list, we think especially of Rini and of Nancy and of those welcoming new babies and of those celebrating marriages and those facing surgeries this week. We know that your healing embrace is in the midst of each of their lives and for that we give you thanks. Go with us now, O oh God, to render unto you all that you deserve. For we are yours wonderfully made and wonderfully loved, given in your image. We pray all of these things, O God, as your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to that which is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. And may the blessing of God rest upon you. May God's peace abide with you. May God's presence illuminate your heart this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.